Hello, I'm Diana Reich, the Artistic Director of the Charleston to Charleston Literary Festival, Join the Conversation, and I'd like to welcome you from wherever you may be watching. Transforming the way that the festival is delivered, from live appearances to an online version, and offering an even stronger, more diverse and plentiful series of events is a reflection of our belief that literature and the arts provide a catalyst for dialogue, creativity, empathy, laughter and tears, binding communities together. We're enormously grateful to all our speakers who've dedicated their time and talents to the festival. Please buy their books as a way of enhancing the festival experience. It's my pleasure to invite you, on behalf of my colleagues and board, as well as myself, to join the conversation. We hope that you'll do so in person next November, if at all possible. Charleston in South Carolina is a beautiful, historic and hospitable town, and the Charleston to Charleston Literary Festival will definitely be going from strength to strength. I'm Suzanne Pollack, Director of Development for the Charleston to Charleston Literary Festival. This year, more than ever, we are so grateful to our generous donors, returning and new, who've made it possible to offer free sessions to everyone everywhere, building a truly international audience. There's still time for you to become a donor. We're taking donations throughout the month of November. So if you would like to become a sponsor, and we urge you to do so, please contact me using my email on the website. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm Diana Reich, the Artistic Director of the Charleston to Charleston Literary Festival, Join the Conversation. I'm so excited to introduce this event, our grand finale, featuring Kwame Kwe Armour, the director of the Young Vic Theatre in London, Gail Reebuck, a director and former chair and CEO of publisher Penguin Random House in the UK, Sheena Wagstaff, head of modern and contemporary art at the Metropolitan Museum of New York, and Simon Sharma, professor of history and art history at Columbia University. These have been precarious times for the arts, yet is it possible that the creativity of the industry will result in experimentation rather than extinction, seizing new opportunities rather than despair. Might this year's crises result in some positive artistic innovations? In order to end the festival on a note of hope, Kwame Kwe Armour, Gail Reebuck and Sheena Wagstaff, chaired by Simon Sharma, will inspire us by exchanging some ideas about fresh ways of thinking. I'd like to thank the panellists in this session for being willing to share their dreams about how the arts will thrive in the future and to welcome everyone who's joining the conversation at the Charleston to Charleston Literary Festival in South Carolina. Richard II, actually. There's a really crazy but wonderful book, if you like it, by a man called Ernst Kantorowicz, that I think came out before the war, um, with a K, yeah, that is called The King's Two Bodies, and it goes relentlessly, but very brilliantly, through that particular theory and what it meant. I mean, you're on. Pardon? You're on. Oh, I'm on, we're on. Yeah. Uh, hello, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> welcome to our, welcome to our chat. Welcome to Charleston to Charleston Festival. Um, very glad you can be with us. Um, and um, it, it's, it strikes me as a, an important and wonderful and suitable um, end finale, a kind of au revoir. We certainly all hope um, to the Charleston Festival. We'll be talking about the fate, really, the destiny, the importance of the arts in this difficult very difficult and no sign of it getting less difficult except for the that rainbow vaccine promised to us at some point in the future this sort of difficult time and here to talk about um it with me or to talk about it i will i, I will just be sort of um uh moving the discussion on uh, are three perfect people to have this discussion 
Um, Sheena Wagstaff, who, um, who is a head curator of modern and contemporary art at the Metropolitan Museum, and who really kind of revolutionized um, the, the way in which the Met could both acquire and present and exhibit contemporary art. Gail Reebuck, who um, is still talking to me, even though she was my boss for a number of years, um, head of a Penguin Random House, and was kind and merciful enough to publish a number of my books, genius publisher, and Kwame Kwe Ama, who is director of The Young Vic. And welcome to you all, and you all have very different angles and attitudes from which to approach this mighty and quite kind of profound subject. So, you know, no, uh, no pressure there, everybody. I just want to begin with one or two remarks um, because at the very beginning, which now seems an extraordinary age ago in March, um, just about the time of the lockdown, the BBC kindly enough asked me to make a, a, a little program, a half hour program about an exhibition at the Ashmolean Museum in Oxford, uh, devoted to the young Rembrandt, the Rembrandt before he went to Amsterdam. And um, the, the, the problem, what, the good thing was I'd actually been to the exhibition anyway, independently, because I was interested in it and was very moved by it. Um, the problem was, of course, actually, um, I couldn't actually be there for the filming of the program, but in a way, um, it, in, in a way in which I think we've had, um, if, if not good things come out of this difficult situation, um, necessity becoming a virtue, then at least a, a need to rethink things. So I was actually simply sent the cameraman who was a genius really into the empty and locked up Ashmolean with nobody in it, with directions about how long to put himself in front of a painting, which particular cutaway details to concentrate on. So I kind of wrote a script. So everything was done rather remotely. And people seem to enjoy it very much, but because there was a degree of immediacy and intimacy between you and the particular painting or drawing or etching that you were looking at um, and, and nothing really in between. But I think above all, there was a kind of weight of poignancy about this kind of empty shut down place. One of the most powerful of those images um, was simply when the camera tr on its way from one work of art to another, travel past the windowed side of the cafe at the Ashmolean and all the chairs were actually on top of the table. So it said, we're not really open for business and we don't really know when we will be, but here's our art anyway. And the program had a kind of wonderful response, but, um, and that was before any of the great museums, the Met, which I've been to since it was uh, since um, since it was reopened um, to see the Jacob Lawrence show, which was utterly transportingly wonderful. Uh, National Gallery in London and, and many more. Um, but I'd love to ask Sheena, who I know has something really interesting to say about about the kind of fate of museum going and about the exhibiting of art in this difficult time. Thank you, Simon. And I would just like to say thank you too to the Charleston Festival and particularly to Diana Reich and her team and Leo Ryan, um, and also to Charleston, to Charleston doing more for soft diplomacy between our two nations than our respective governments are doing. So well done. Um, I have been asked by Simon to talk a little bit about the museum sector and I only have three minutes in which to do it. So I'm afraid I'm going to read because I want to get as much information in as possible. Um, so we closed, um, all, all museums did, um, around the 13th of March, and since then we've faced numerous existential crises. And as our economy has been subordinated by a global disease propagated by a small bat, like all other sectors, we've been dealing with financial crises during, due to the museum shutdowns, resulting in drastically decreased revenue, staffing reductions, and the cancellation of huge numbers of exhibitions. So for example, the Met, which receives no federal funding, is currently attracting only 23% of our pre-COVID audiences. Our revenue streams are even worse. They're at 16% of pre-COVID levels. That means that we have a projected $150 million deficit this, this financial year up until the 30th of June of next year. And we are already now modeling new financial scenarios for another anticipated shutdown. 
The second event was that museums were already wrestling with the implications of structural racism and social inequity well before this moment. I'm just going to put this up quickly. Um, I've done this right, yeah. Um, this is a slide of Wangechi Mutu. She's a Kenyan American artist. It's one of four bronze sculptures called The New Ones Will Free Us. And it's a manifesto of sorts that takes a critical stance on what lies behind and beyond the facade of the Met. It's just one very small example. But it wasn't until the calculated cold-blooded murder of George Floyd on May the 25th by a police officer that rocked America and provoked a national and indeed international moment of reckoning. It set off what may be the biggest wave of protest in US history. An estimated 15 to, 15 to 26 million Americans took to the streets, including between 45 to 60 white Americans who supported Black Lives Matter. But within museums, Black Lives Matter was expanded to the notion of BIPOC, Black, Indigenous and people of color, with the latter including all immigrant nationalities who are the focus of discriminatory practices. And as you can see on the right, <coughs> the placard says in Persian, Black lives are important. The Black Lives Matter movement made American museums a target of scrutiny as external critics and internal staff called on them to acknowledge their structural racism and histories in staffing, acquisitions practices, administration and leadership and governance still predominantly run, of course, by white men. As Lonnie Bunch, a very wise man who is the founder director of the National Museum for African American History and Culture in DC and now the head of the Smithsonian Institution commented, quote, museums are shaped by the same institutional racism that has shaped this country. American, America can only understand itself if it understands its own diversity. Museums need to help people understand how to embrace ambiguity within stories of race and gender. And I want to come back to that later, maybe in the conversation. In July 2020, the Met issued a document entitled 13 Commitments to Anti-Racism, Diversity and a Stronger Community. Many of these commitments have already been put into practice, such as appointing candidates of color to trustee and senior leadership positions paid internships with no nepotism tolerated, mandatory ongoing anti-racism training, rewriting interpretive labels to include contextual historic facts, and questioning the vocabulary we use, such as the word masterpiece. Related to this, a recent furore over the work of the white American artist, Philip Guston, exemplifies the sheer complexity of this moment in America. And I just, I've, I've run out of time now, my three minutes, but I'm just going to quote one more um, comment by Darren Walker, who's the head of the Ford Foundation, which is actively supporting diversity and inclusion of African-Americans in the, in the arts. And he defended the National Gallery's decision to postpone the exhibition <coughs> of Philip Guston by saying, quote, what those who criticize the decision to postpone it do not understand is that in the past few months, the context in the US has fundamentally profoundly changed on issues of incendiary and toxic racist imagery and art, regardless of the virtue or intention of the artist who created it. This is a super complex situation and it signals a flashpoint for museums, especially in America. So I'm looking forward to our conversation in a second. Good, thanks very much, um, Sheena. And we will absolutely get back to that immediately. Uh, all those hot potatoes sizzling away. Um, Gail, could I, could I ask you to talk? It, it, it's been claimed that actually of all the arts in the kind of predicament as a result of the pandemic, literature or reading and publishing um, has done best actually. And is that, is that a misplaced conventional wisdom? Um, no, I think, I mean, in the UK, certainly compared to museums and theatres, I mean, you could argue that publishing has actually flourished, even though the, the numbers that have just come out show a decrease year on year in the first six months of the year for print books, but made up slightly through an increase in ebooks and in audiobooks. 
I mean, I see the COVID crisis as, as in two parts. There's COVID innocence and COVID experience. I mean, bookshops shut down, high street bookshops, um, on, on, on both occasions, back in March, and now again, um, they are shut as we speak for the second time. But I think there was a different feel to, to both episodes. I mean, the first one, I mean, we literally shut the office thinking that it was only going to be a few weeks. Well, we haven't actually gone back to the office and that's many, many months later. So somehow or another, in all the fear and the kind of adrenaline of suddenly finding yourself isolated at home, we realized that actually remote working works and, and the show kept on the road. We kept publishing books, although many publishers delayed a number of their key titles out of the spring to the late summer and early autumn. So now when you know, we're closed down again, we are in the, the ripest and most important period you know, for, for the publishing industry. But there was a huge amount of adrenaline in that first lockdown with authors wanting to um, live stream, they wanted to help, they wanted to communicate more. And there were lots and lots of ideas. It was almost as if creativity was unleashed. Then, as time went on, um, it changed. And in this second lockdown, which I call COVID experience, it's much darker, much more nuanced. Um, there's a lot of adaptive stress. Morale is very fragile. And there's almost the impossibility of creating momentum within a company, a publishing company, when you have endless kind of Zoom fatigue. Now, bookshops, are still shut this time around. However, there are new initiatives like bookshop.org for the independents who've got together to be able to um, supply books to the homes of their um, loyal customers. I mean, Waterstones, the equivalent of Barnes and Noble, um, have a click and collect service and also an excellent online service. But I suppose the savior of the book industry was Amazon, um, who have continued to supply books through most of the pandemic, apart from a few weeks on the first lockdown when they decided to deprioritize books. Um, to Sheena's point, um, the killing of, 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 of George Floyd was an, an absolutely extraordinary moment um, for the publishing industry in the UK. And I'm not going to go into everything that we've done in response to that, but it has provoked a complete rethink, not before time, of the way in which we operate, um, the look of um, the senior folk in the publishing industry, the kinds of books that we publish, and um, let's talk about that, um, you know, in a little bit, because I'm sure everyone's got a lot to say about um, the measures that have been taken. But the one thing that I've been thinking a lot about during these various lockdowns is the nature of creativity itself. Um, how do we have ideas and how do we get those ideas to market? And I'm pretty convinced now that from a publisher's point of view, as opposed to an author's point of view, because paradoxically authors always work in an isolated way when they're actually um, writing their books, but from a publishing point of view- This one does. <laughs> I write like lots of stuff in noisy cafes <laughs> that account comes for... out. It just comes out, does it? I'm sure, Simon, it just sort of flows out of you. But um, what we really, really miss is the chaos of person-to-person -person brainstorming, the serendipity of conversations, you know, in the corridor. And even the chief economist of the Bank of England said the other day that home working was net-net the, en the enemy of creativity. And I think um, I I'm convinced that's true because for all the cognitive tunneling and the kind of, you know, lack of distraction you could have if you're lucky at home, what he said was what creativity is gained and improved tunneling is lost in the darkness of the tunnel itself. So, you know, maybe we will get on to talk about creativity. Um, and I'll leave you with one thought that was so interesting to me. On the one hand, um, authors, and I know you know her very well, Nigella Lawson, who was finishing her wonderful new cookbook, Cook, Eat, Repeat, you know, during the pandemic, her book was put together with all its photography, its testing, its design, the complexity of it when everybody was at home. I mean, people just didn't meet until right at the end when they had a 
10 hour session um, in a garden and kind of made sure the book worked before it went to press. But the authors I've spoken to talked to me about trying to write during the pandemic. And although arguably they were still on their usual schedules, they found it really, really difficult to get into the flow of writing um, through this pandemic. But interestingly, once they were in it, and when I read some of the material they produced, I have to say that paradoxically, it was some of the best material that it, they'd ever produced. So something strange and interesting, some strange kind of alchemy is going on there. That's all I'm gonna say. Thank you. Yeah, no, I want to come back to that, Gail. Kwame, I'd love to, love to hear what you, in some ways, I, I remember particularly before we knew that the United Kingdom government was going to provide absolute vital oxygen in the shape of funding um, to the performing arts. We, uh, I mean, it goes without saying that as difficult as the situation is for the for museums and the visual arts, really difficult with, with uh, uh, revenue streams drying up, it, it seemed absolutely crucifying really for the performing arts, both in theater and and, and music really, because, and also, I, 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 and again, you'll correct me if this is, this is wrong, but also because there is so much, you know, the little live on, on stage things. Um, uh, the only experience I have with that is, uh, and it may have well have been a stage too far, was actually doing a live show, taking Wordy, my last book, as a, a partly a musical performance around the country, um, spring before last. So while by no means, you know, a trooper, I have sort of some sense of actually how important the kind of chemistry between audience and performance is, how it can really, and that was just completely cut off. So do, do you want to say a bit about, you know, how difficult it's been or how challenging or maybe, you know, whatever positive things might have come out from this really serious challenge? I think I was on mute. mute. Yeah, yeah, no, one, no. Of, one, of, one of the many sins of the Zoom live. <laughs> have I, you know, am I mute? Um, yeah, I, I, I would. Um, but I'd also like to say to Sheena, I, just before lockdown, I was in New York. So I went to see the Sahel e exhibition at the Met. And, uh, and I saw the Wangus outside. And it was magnificent. But what was also magnificent about it, I say not to blow smoke, but pre our summer of social justice and social injustice, um, to be able to see statements coming out of those Wangu uh, statues that, that affirmed a, a place of the black artist in the present and the future. And then to go deep inside and to see the past um, was, was really um, reinforcing. My wife and I had a brilliant day at your, at your, at your museum. And, and I, just wanna, I just wanna give thanks to, to, to that foresight um, to, to get there before us. Um, uh, yeah, it's been a it's been a really hard summer, right? But I, I, oh God, you you talk about the kinesthetic relationship between the artist and the audience, and there there is no real theatre without the live audience. There are versions of liveness, and I think that that is going to be the future. We are all going to invest in further negotiating what versions and manifestations of liveness look like, and and I think the real people who will be at the cutting edge will be the people who are going to be thinking about it in uh, 3D terms, thinking about it in terms of XR, thinking about the next lockdowns that we may have and how to bring a sense of three-dimensionality into what is a two-dimensional form. As, as you've, you've spoken about often, uh, you know, the, we have seen a, a rush for people to create monologues um, online or to put their back catalog up through YouTube. And all of that has been magnificent and, 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 and beautiful. And the financial support, philanthropic financial support we have gotten from that has been pretty wonderful. But for me, the, the, the hardest thing is that theater is in an abstract art form. And, and, and television and film invariably is, is quite linear or literal. In theater, I say to you, I'm here in Paris and your mind does the work. In film, I say I'm in Paris and I need to see some kind of monument behind me to tell me that I'm there. And, and I think that's going to be our major challenge going forward. How to make sure that when we leave this portal, we arrive at a place where three-dimensionality 
is still at the heart of it. For me, I have changed through this um, lockdown. Oh, of course, we're on lockdown two. But lockdown one in particular, I think it's totally and utterly changed me. And we talk about George Floyd, and, and, and quite correctly we talk about George Floyd, and the, the horrors of it. But I had lost my rag, as it were, a few days before that with Christopher Cooper, with that incident in Central Park, because those kind of microaggressions are the kind that people like me experience on a day to day. Police brutality, yes, I fear for my children. I have three boys and a daughter and I fear in particular for my boys who are six foot five, six foot two and, and in between. And I, I fear for them in, you know, in terms of being stopped by the police, et cetera, et cetera. But my personal experiences are the experiences of the Amy Cooper, of the microaggression of saying that white is right and, and how that makes itself manifest, not just in a face to face, but within the very institution of theater. The very institution of theater sits on the premise that theater began in Greece. It is not true. I commissioned Ben Okri to write um, a play of the epic poem, Sunuhe, which was a dramatic piece performed in e ancient Egypt. It is 6,000 years old. That we know the Egyptian um, mystery plays are probably the most performed play in the history of man and woman as we understand it. But yet we ignore that and build it on the premise of a supposed white supremacy born out of a Greek myth of creation. That is what we find ourselves struggling with in the here and now and what we will struggle with tomorrow. It is why I referenced Sheena and Wang Gu's work and uh, Sahel, because actually the combination of knowing that we existed in the past in a way that was, uh, that, 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 was, that was manifest of the flaws of humanity, but also the greatness of humanity, but also that we belong in the future through articulations of great art. The, that's the real challenge that I think that we are going to face in the 20th in the 21st century, in fact, the 2020s, which we know the 1920s defined the first half of the 20th century. Sorry, Simon, I'm, I'm ready to be contradicted by you. But, oh, yeah. um, but I, I believe that that will be the same for us. That, you know, there was 1818, the, the, the great flu, and we're having it in, in 2019. We define ourselves right here and now. So this summer has been a summer of great pain, but it is a, a portal, it is 2020, the ability to look back, to look forward and define the path. Well, there's a, there is a paradox, if not a contradiction between the two things you want to do, that's all I would say, namely the, the, the essential ethical issues that you want to grapple with. And I want to ask you immediately really whether or not you think theater as you've known it has actually been able to do that in over the last decade in a way which you know, which which is positive rather than, um, you know, full of uh, kind of forbidding outcomes. And so you want you want to communicate what you've just been describing very passionately. But on the other hand, you've said quite rightly, and this is the issue we're all grappling with, um, the, the means to actually do this, to perform it out, have shrunk because of because of biology, you know, because of what's happened to us, really. So the question I want to put to you is really, you know, how, how do you how do you do that in in the least auspicious circumstances? And in in particular, one thing which strikes me as not altogether a bad thing um, is, of course, the whole place of streaming live performances, which on the one hand is really a kind of inadequate synthetic substitute for being there face to face inside the kind of sweat box of the theater, you know, which, which has the kind of attentiveness absolutely wired up to max voltage. Uh, on the other hand, of course, actually live stream performances, um, which were going out before the pandemic to be sure, you know, will reach public way beyond anybody who can afford to go to New York and London. And, you know, the potential there for actually having a kind of mass audience for what you want to say and however it is you want to say it is, is there, isn't it? And, you know, has, have, have the kind of the pressure of circumstances made that more possible, you know, made it, made it more possible for you to get the message out. I, I, answering it in, in reverse, I, I would say um, that it, it's going to be about 
how we, those two things, the live, the sweat box, as you so eloquently call it, and the digital, how they sit with each other. I don't believe there'll be a theater in the country or a board in either, either in the United States or, or in Europe who will allow an artistic director to create work without having cameras in there to some mm -hmm. degree. They will, and, and, and so, and I'd like to sub the word cameras and put access uh, in its place. The, the building um, access um, in many ways will be our raison d'etre. And, but it doesn't have to be, uh, you know, it, it doesn't have to be a mutual sum game. I, for instance, have been dealing with what I call digital byproducts. I've been doing going online work um, since I ran Baltimore Center Stage in Maryland. I've, I've been doing that, but only when they run together. My issue has been in this summer, is why I've been slightly resistant to it. It's just like, it only exists when we have them both, when the live runs and the, and the, the digital becomes a catalyst for the debate to engage in the live. I think I'm gonna to have to slightly move and I have moved to go there, going to have to run concurrent. And I think that that is absolutely the way that we're gonna go. And then technology is going to have to take us into new forms of coding, as I've said, to bring um, to bring the three-dimensional body in possibly holographic form into our environment. But I would say the other thing is, I, I think we have to also plan with hope in our hearts. I am planning with my executive director on quicksand every day. We are creating, like everybody else, multiple scenarios so that if the vaccine kicks in, that maybe the model that we had before can be adapted to help us social distance at the beginning or actually physical distance. I hate the term social distance. And then possibly we might get back to capacity with the model that we currently have by September, by the, by the fall. However, my final point on that is that may or it may not happen. What we're going to have to do in the theater sector is completely and utterly overhaul our subsidized model because the subsidized model that we have right now is not, was not fit for purpose going in and it absolutely is not fit for purpose on the way out. I'll come back to you later because I wanna hear what, what the problem is and, and, how, and how the subsidized model should change. But I wanna ask Sheena something. Um, in the light of you know, the way you passionately put it about the, um, about the exercise in collective self-examination that's been going on, um, rightly and um, in very intensively um, through the Black Lives Matter program and the, uh, the response to all uh, traumatic events, the murder of, of George Floyd and so on. And something else actually, of course, that has been in the air really for a while now, and that's great museums, collections of objects, um, including objects from, you know, from the uh, from the Afro-Asian world, um, and uh, which are, you know, at the center. And there's been some sense, some feeling at all, if you're really going to be sensitive to actually the integrity of non-Western art, that these should go back to where they came from. I mean, have you, um, has, that, has that been part of the discussions at the Met? Yeah, yeah, you know, is there is there a limit to actually altruism in the world of the social conscience of the museum. You're muted, you're muted. Sheena, you're muted, you're muted. <laughs> you Sorry, I, um, I knew you were going to bring this up and I would rather not talk about repatriation. I mean, if you were to follow it down its, um, down its logical path, there would be no need for museums whatsoever. And to go to what Kwame was saying, which was um, about the relationship or the interrelationship or the kind of parallel working of the two dimensional and the three dimensional is something that I, I wanted to talk with more about, about more because I, I think there's a parallel between theater and performance and the museum in that respect, which is the physical as well as the kind of the digital experience. But to go about to go to this idea of kind of living in the world, telling the story about the vision of, of a vision of the world that we would like to live in, which goes to the kind of very heart of the of the kind of BIPOC or Black Lives Matter. I, I think, you know, one of the things that 
Kwame talked about, and, and one of the things that we are engaged with at the moment, particularly because of the result of the last election, which we haven't even mentioned in this session, although it has been in others, I think probably, is that um, rather than sort of talking about party politics, it is what the function of the museum is now. What is its value right now? What is the value of theatre now? What, what is the value of, of the museum? And how can museums respond to this really crucial moment that you know nothing is resolved nothing is resolved in the in the in, i mean the, the election has changed um the parameters or the goalposts but nothing has actually happened yet and i think what museums can do is to um is to deny and this is certainly what the met is doing their position of neutrality and to engage with politics with a small p not a big p and to really have a role in reinforcing the missions and values within our communities of what a civil society is, what our, what our responsibilities are to our communities, what defines a museum as the heart of a community. And that's not what we've done in the past. And I think just to sort of add to that, to Kwame's point about, you, you know, theatre originating in, you know, 6,000 years ago in Egypt, we have an opportunity right now in the Encyclopedic Museum, notwithstanding your point, Simon, about repatriation, is that most Encyclopedic Museums start with a very sort of received notion of you go into the Great Hall and you have a choice of turning left into Greek and Roman, right into Egyptian, up the Great Hall, stairs to European painting, boom, you know. Why don't we change this? This is a wonderful opportunity to actually rethink it, start in the present and look back to the past, have modern art there, living artists, living in the present, living in the now. That's what artists are dealing with. That's what constitutes the collection of an encyclopedic museum back 5,000 years, not six. At the Met, that is. What, what, what would be your dream? Um, you, you really have two rather wonderful pieces of contemporary art in the lobby, which are actually about race and identity and um, those huge history paintings, which are wonderful. But um, what would be your dream, um, you know, alternative then? Let's have Sheena's version of the choices available to you once you walk inside the museum. Oh, that's great. Um, I think I would have African on one side, and I would have um, probably the Middle East that goes back to the ancient Near East with Egyptian. All of these, it is, it's such an anomaly. You look at the British Museum and the Met is exactly the same, is that you have geographic regions that of course change over time. The chronologies get muddled, the, the borders change over time. And so the definition of each department and the collection that it def that that it um, presents is um, becomes very inexact. I mean, you are thinking about the Middle East and what we're doing now in terms of modern contemporary art, which is called Menak. You know, the Middle East, North Africa, um, Turkey, Iran, and Iraq. And yet, at the same time, the Middle East also contains Greece, which is the seat of Western civilization. So there are these anomalies that that occur in museums and i i think that i don't know to start with medieval even would be an interesting idea medieval across the world including medieval islamic not just european or western european can i just jump in and say so this is really rude of me but your polynesian is quite extraordinary <laughs> thank you yeah, they are. But then the, the, those are the galleries which are they, it is an amazing room it's a beautiful room but it's those are the galleries which are emptiest always really whenever i go to the met they really are um gail i just want to say um you know one of the things i really want us all to reflect on if we can if you feel like it uh, you, it's already happened in in some of the comments you've made i mean i wonder whether or not you know thinking quite apart from the structure of publishing and its uh, exigencies or its opportunities whether it's made you reflect yourself on, you know, how elemental the act of reading is. I mean, whether, whether or not you've been thinking, you know, think about your life in publishing, in producing books, in feeling the kind of reader's response, actually. Um, and I, I, I don't know about you, I mean, you were talking about, you were talking about the um, uh, writers 
if, if you and I had talked a lot, you, you'd have heard me kind of crutch terribly really about, I mean, I'm somebody who needs maximum social distraction. I need distraction in order to concentrate rather annoyingly and, and paradoxically, um, hence a bit of writing done in the noisy coffee shops, which I now miss a lot, but sort of sense actually of what both the pro creative production of literature, of writing means, and the creative and the consumption of it means what in, in a kind of, you know, Boccaccio's to Camerone, main, when we're all in an extreme and abnormal position. I mean, have, have you kind yeah, of- well, I, I think if it's one of my own experience, I mean, in, in the first lockdown, I, I, I read voraciously and I also listened to books um, because I used to try and do my 10,000 steps every day when I could walk. Um, and, you know, I decided to listen to all three volumes of Hilary Mantel, which was wonderful. You know, 57 wow. hours, you know, I lived in another, in another world. I mean, to some of the points that um, other people have been making, I mean, publishing has transitioned to digital a long time ago. I mean, it seems to make no difference. We have a physical book, we have an audio book, we have a digital book, you can consume that book in any which way you like. And now, you know, we've just actually launched a new podcasting company, yet another way of telling a different kind of story. I mean, what I found fascinating in the first lockdown were the types of books that people were buying. I mean, it was almost like taking the pulse of the nation. I mean, it, it, it began because all the schools were closed with people buying uh, books from one of our publishers, Dorling Kindersley, um, which were edutainment. In other words, how are we going to keep our kids occupied at home when we're trying to work? And that's what they bought. And crafts and all that kind of thing had a sort of absolute spike on Amazon, which was really interesting. Um, the other interesting thing is that although, you know, the number of physical books have declined slightly in the first six months, I'm sure they'll go up in, in, in if, when we get to the end of the year, um, people are turning to more fiction. In other words, they want to escape, whereas mm. nonfiction had been the more dominant form, let's say, last year. So I think, um, I mean, storytelling, I mean, we're, we're the purest form. I've never thought, I've never believed, you know, that we were at risk um, in any way. Um, I think if there's one thing that really does worry me, it's the health of the high street um, and, and discovery because we publish a huge number of new books. And what we also found was that, you know, there are some books that kind of catch the zeitgeist, if you like, a kind of balm to the soul, you know, through, um, through the two lockdowns. But what I worry about longer term, uh, is the possibility of bookshops closing, whether they be chains or independents, because 77% of um, discovery takes place in a bookshop. And as an industry, we haven't cracked discovery yet, despite spending a lot of money on digital discovery, but we haven't really cracked it at scale yet. And that worries me for the first novel, the gentle, the little fragile book that is very beautiful that needs word of mouth. In other words, you know, needs a, a platform on which it can be uh, on which it can be discovered. So if I'm worried about one thing, I mean, for example, um, we're publishing President Obama's um, A Promised Land yeah, on the 17th. And, yeah, on the 17th in two days' time. I mean, this would have been a glorious opportunity for independent bookshops to have lots of people wander in, pick up that book. But while they were there, they'd have looked around and they'd have seen maybe one or two other books that they hadn't heard of that they might have bought at the same time. We've lost all of that. And that is incredibly sad. Um, I mean, yeah, well, we're, we're, we're talking, we're speaking through a literary festival, of course, actually. And, um, you know, well, that, all literary that, festivals have had to reinvent themselves as here we are, you know, sort of, mm. I mean, on the one hand, there's the positive that, you know, it's being kind of streamed in the US and the UK at the same time. And we're, we're both, you know, we're all sitting on different sides of the Atlantic. But, um, you know, for other literary festivals, um, it's been really difficult, you know, when they didn't know whether they could be physical or purely digital. And, uh, you know, rather like the theatre, a lot of them depend on, um, uh, donations and they've been drying up. I mean, the whole philanthropic, um, 
the sort of environment in the UK is pretty much um, dried up at the moment. Um, so it's it's been a real challenge. And this is what I meant about discovery, you know, that one way a new author might actually sell their wares would be to travel around the country and, and actually perform, maybe to small audiences right. at literary festivals. But that... Sometimes they're quite big because I think actually, and I, I miss, I know it's a small footnote, but I, I know I speak for a lot of my fellow authors um, who love signings, you know, actually it's often thought that we do this, um, you know, under duress, we don't at all. It's actually one of the most wonderful and enriching and gratifying things, very comparable to, I you completely know, the agree. I mean, the I performance think I with around. you and so many authors after a presentation, a physical presentation at a festival with that long snaking queue yeah. of people who come you know, often they buy the new book, but then they come with all the books, the old books from their shelves. And there's something That's incredibly right. touching about that yeah. moment. And that moment where they have the, you know, the, the, this incredible moment where they're actually meeting the author who has changed their lives through, right. you know, through their books. And, and here's yeah, crushing, exactly. Here's the crushing paradox, really. And I think part of the, you know, the kind of popularity and, um, engagement in in live theatre and in things like authors actually having a face-to-face -face contact with their readership at literary festivals um, and the sort of sense actually in a museum gallery of a group of you all paying attention. I'll say this, Sheena, um, you've been thanked quite rightly for, you know, wonderful shows at the Met. And I do also want to shout out for the extraordinary Jacob Lawrence, you know, show that you had, which... Um, uh, the, the, which are which are little paintings um, done on hardboard, actually, which represent that great African American artist's um, enterprise of locating his own experience within the great narrative of American history. And precisely because they're very little works of art, um, even though we did respect social distance, actually, there was a, a sort of sense of concentrated cluster of attentiveness. I mean, it's a, it was a deeply, deeply emotive kind of show. And, and all this, I think, has been partly, you know, the kind of, um, it's been partly a response to the kind of chilliness of, the di of digital connection. I'm not saying any of us are now being chilly in the slightest, really, but it's, it's a struggle sometimes to kind of overcome the coolness of electronic connectedness. And a lot of the kind of, you know, wonderful adrenaline whoosh you get in, 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 in when you're with live art, with performed art, or with the, the immediacy of a work of art in front of you, um, you know, is, 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 has, has really made life bearable in, 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 in terms of an escape from the relentless suffocation from our, a word I really hate, devices you know <laughs> art is the escape from devices so i don't know Kwame, what you what you think about that so it's a paradox it goes back to what we were saying what you were saying in particular you were saying well it the, the two things have to kind of work together streaming will reach an audience you couldn't imagine you know necessarily being able to find the time or money or being interested in coming to to London sort of see something that's going to happen in a young Vic. On the other hand, you want it somehow to have the kind of heartbeat of, you know, the warmth of, of a live performance. Yeah, yes, I, I'm, I'm you know, I, I, I think I often say to my children, judge me not by their dispensation, but by mine. Um, as I try to, to judge my parents and, and, and people before them. And so I often have one eye on, on the future. Like I agree with every syllable that you've just said about the coldness of digital and the warmth of, 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 of the physical, of being able to stand in line um, as I did in, in, in Washington DC. And I think it was 1998, um, waiting for August Wilson, the magnificent playwright to sign my plays. And, uh, and, he, and I turned behind me and I bought the book and, and then when I turned back, he had gone. But yet I felt somehow that I was in the same room as his magic and therefore I was touched by it. But of course that is my dispensation. And I'm sure that, that my children 
and their children will feel the same way about the dreaded devices and how the dreaded devices was actually three dimensional to them as opposed to one dimensional to me. And I think that's our job as curators, right? It is, it is to, to feed the here and now with an eye on the future of how we inch our audiences to that new place. And that's going to be, as I've said, and as, as we've all said, I think finding the, the, the balance, finding the way that privileges, um, either the physical or the digital at both, but finding the moment to choose that interlocking relationship, I think is the thing that I, that I wrestle with, is the thing I'm gonna be wrestling with, along with, quite frankly, um, when can I hug people again in my rehearsal rooms? Uh, <laughs> right? Uh, like, 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 I mean, you know, my practice as a director is predicated on the physical, whereas other directors might speak on the God mic to the directors on the stage. I run up and I whisper, I talk, and we, and we come in and we greet each other and the haptic technology and the haptic exchange of hugging or touching or what you call it, even if you call it loviness, I don't, of course, I call it technology. But that, um, I'm going to have to re, um, rethink my process. And in one respect, that's dreadful. And in another respect, it's pretty fantastic because yeah. uh, that's what keeps us alive. Yeah. Sheena, do you have anything like that going on in kind of rethinking the process of what an installation or what a show might be? I uh, think that I, what Gail just said about these points of discovery got me thinking a little bit more about this. And I, I absolutely agree with you too, Kwame, about this. And I, you know, the, the very the very fact that people hit the streets in such large numbers to count as bodies on the street. They could have signed a petition. There were lots of, I mean, it was in the middle of the COVID crisis at that time, but they went en masse. It was about a manifestation of the three dimensions as opposed to, I mean, that's what we do. That's what we're there for. And so, you know, in the, I totally agree with you. I think that there is, I mean, there's one more slide I wanted to just share, which I will do very, very quickly, which is um, that, um, and this comes to what I was going to say, which is about the necessity for taking risks, um, which is about discovery. Oh, yeah. And yeah. that's this. Um, and these are, these are, they're called crossroads and they're in the museum right now. And they combine, a number of different um, figures from different so-called civilizations across the Met. And this is the, an experiment and um, bringing together a number of different departments, curators working with each other, writing these really brilliant labels. But I think they are also very problematic to some extent too. And I think the curators themselves felt that they were being put in a position where to juxtapose two figures, just like the ones on the left, um, created more questions than answers. But I think in the end, you know, that is okay. That's what we have to be doing. It's not the kind of discovery that you would get through digital exploration. It has to happen in, in, in reality, in the three-dimensional three reality. I, I realize that there are hundreds of chat questions and I'm, so maybe I should stop talking and hand back to Simon. No, I'm wondering, um, I'm, not, I'm not sure, Diana, we, we would like to take questions actually from some of you out there. Um, and Leah is gonna help us, I think, but um, uh, if, if Leah is actually <laughs> art and technology, um, they're all above here in the chat but I, that Leah says, but I'm not actually seeing them. Why am I not seeing them? Oh, in the chat, okay, do I need to, Hit that, okay. Ah, oh, yeah, okay, good, good, good. Thank you, Leah, okay. Um, yeah, let me, um, yeah, let me, let me, let me take, and this is, this is for all of you, but I think particularly, um, yeah, a, maybe particularly for you, Kwame, a, a, a question from, um, oh, um, a, a question from Peter says, have lockdown digital events primed audiences for more adventurous tastes going forward? Um, I don't know, have you, have you had any response about that? Do you think, or are you ready? I, 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 I don't know, but I imagine one of my favorite sayings that trauma is best served at a distance. 
And so I, I don't, I, it, it's difficult for me to make a judgment on that. What I will say is during lockdown, when we have done digital projects, we at one point we had a show where we could only have 84 people in our theater physically, but we had 1800 queuing up to get tickets for that. And then another 500 for each one of those places online. And that shows that showed us that there is a demand for the physical as we've been talking about, but there also is a demand for, for the digital. And so I think when we come out of this lockdown, and I think probably we won't probably know, probably know for about a year, I think our audiences, I think, will be more primed to investigate what theatre looks like, possibly with VR, AR and XR, than they may have been before the lockdown. Mm. Um, Mike asks, and I, this is this is a powerful question, which we can't um, we can't part company without addressing directly. We 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 suggested some things, but he says, please speak to whether or not the pandemic has one created a bump in the road to which we'll eventually return to where we were before, or two, an acceleration going where we were before, but sooner than what we expected. Um, and uh, this sounds like the future of cultural travel, really. But all three, a completely new trajectory, an entirely new future. Do you, do you want to talk about, Gail, do you want to start about um, whether or not there's going to be some revolution? We're not quite yet. I do, I, I, well, from a publishing perspective, I think we're already in it. And, and I think we knew we were in it. It is now digital fast. I mean, most of our books, you know, through this pandemic have been sold um, online, whether they're physical or digital. Um, and um, authors have become used to actually um, doing live streams. And it was very interesting when we did our first one of one particular author. I remember on the day, I think we got about 800 people watching. And I thought, oh, well, that doesn't sound very exciting. But... Three days later, 20,000 had actually viewed wow. it, and so it went up. So I think people are finding new ways to discover, um, you know, relating to, to those um, that they want to hear from. So I think Digital First is, 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 will post that bump in the road, and I think that is absolutely central to the way in which um, we as publishers will operate in the future. But to Kwame's point, it's too early for the creative writers to have actually assimilated what you know, this pandemic means for them. I mean, we will be seeing in about a year's time the most extraordinary things. I don't know what they're going to be. I don't know where it's going to take um, different voices, um, um, different perspectives on life, transformational novels or nonfiction. I don't know where, where it's going to go, but I know it's going to happen because I really do think that, you know, writers, obviously, I would think this, are going to be the spokespeople for all of us to sort of somehow externalise what is bubbling away inside us. So um, mm. I think we're past the bump in the road and we're sort of into the future. We just don't see it yet. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, and sometimes really the serendipity of history really gives you the marching orders or, you know, you've got Barack Obama's book coming out in two days time after this, you know, astounding election in which more votes were cast than in any election in American history. Um, and still with a kind of bizarrely open-ended dra open drama, um, the battle for actual truth and knowledge and facts um, still going on in front of us. But I mean, that is a perfect situation where, I don't know, you know, by some piece of historical magic, a, a huge uh, theater of reflection about what a presidency is. And in particular, the relationship between presidential leadership and the gift of language, <laughs> which I loved. I think it was in the book is just beautifully written. I mean, it is. Yes, yes. Uh, yes. I mean, really exquisite. I mean, in another life, he could have been a novelist, may become one. In maybe, the he will. <laughs> maybe he will. He is but, a um, absolutely beautifully written. Sheena, did you want to say something to that last question or not particularly about whether or not we're going to go back to where we were, whether or not there's going to be a qualitative change that's accelerated by what we've been going through? I think, as, as Gail said, we're, we, we've gone past the bump in the road. I think it is up to museums as repository of real objects, which is different from books, literature and performance. 
in that we have a responsibility, which is why I think we've been scrutinized so much um, to write history. And I think it is, I think it is you know, um, expected of us that we rewrite histories, that we um, rewrite even past histories and redefine the way that we write histories in the future. And that has to come from so much of what, so, so much of the work that we have been doing as a result of Black Lives Matter, and also um, particularly in the United States and the, the current uncivil discourse that um, continues uh, to happen before the president elect becomes the president. It's a huge issue here. Yeah. Um, yeah, there's just one question for you, Kwame, um, before we, I thank you all very much for your brilliant discussion and, and we alas wind up, but somebody's asking you to be a bit clearer and I wanted you, I, I would love to hear that about what the new subsidized model you think you should be moving towards in theater would be. You said you- uh, look, look. Yes, a, 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 absolutely. Um, so I, I would say at the moment, most theaters, certainly London theaters, um, we've moved over the last 30 years from possibly 70% subsidy and then 30% box office to a model of roughly a third, a third, a third, a third government subsidy, a third box office, a third philanthropy and other income streams. Now, of course, as soon as March 13th hit us, um, the philanthropy actually, that was very much linked to the shows that you have on, just fell off. Box office just fell off. Alternative income streams just fell off. I think Gail spoke about philanthropy in our country hitting a, a kind of wall at the moment, which, which I think we're all experiencing donor fatigue to a, to a degree. And so this model that we've been marched very, very, very particularly to and purposefully towards enterprise and entrepreneurship in terms of the art that you create, I think that's going to happen. Well, it's, it, it was dead. It didn't work then. And now it absolutely is not going to work. So I think I think we're going to have to investigate a slightly uh, closer relationship to the European model, which means that the reason we have subsidized art is because it cannot stand on its own. We know it's your spinach. We know it's your fried plantain if you're West African or West Indian. We know it's the stuff that you go, you need this in order to explore yourself, your heart, your nation, and to represent this moment in time. It, most of our work cannot stand without subsidy and we're going to have to increase the subsidy. Some may call that um, socialist, some may call it heavier government, but I think until we find another model that is absolutely going to be the bridge, sometimes the river is the bridge. Mm. Kwame, can I come in that I so agree with you on this and and don't you think that you know we we've come a long way in the creative industries in the UK you know we've mapped them you know in terms of their you know financial contribution but what we haven't nailed yet and what we must nail is their contribution to our well-being and citizenship and the reasons why precisely they should be subsidized because you know if you look you know 30 years ahead you know when white collar jobs are going to be done by machines or whatever we're going to have so much leisure time that is the moment when theater and the arts generally can be there as transformative in people's well-being their health their inclusion in, in, the, in the greater sense, understanding other cultures, all of the above is the big argument. And we haven't made that argument yet in all of our industries, or at least we've done it in bits, but it hasn't, we haven't nailed it yet. I, I think you're absolutely right. And I think that the streaming companies and their shares have proven your point to be absolutely right during lockdown. <laughs> that, uh, that we, what did we, most of us do? Retreat to narratives. We retreated to find ourselves and protect ourselves in narratives, be they read, written, performed, or reflected back at us. And so absolutely, we need to make that argument loud and clearly and separate it from an ideology that says somehow it should stand by itself. It stands absolutely. on its own two feet in order to hold us up. And yeah. museums uh, too, uh, I include those, yes. <laughs> No, I think we all, <laughs> it's just like one of these wonderful discussions to get to the real heart of the matter, 
when we're about to say goodbye. Really <laughs> and we've all done it in order that we obviously are going to, courtesy of Charleston to Charleston and Diana and, and Leah, we're obviously going to reconvene one year from now and immediately address this. And I will just... I would just thank you so much for your contribution. We're all agreed we're singing from the same page in which we all believe that culture and how all the different forms we've been talking about is not a luxury, but an absolute necessity for the, for the sustenance of our humanity, understanding ourselves and understanding others too. But the hideous conclusion of this bitter election. You, I think it was Sheena who said, we haven't talked about this yet, so we'll be able to say something about it in our reunion discussion one year down. The difficult and painful reality is that we're making this case gratuitously to each other and to a sympathetic audience, to the audience that, is, that decided it did not want to vote for another four years of Donald Trump. We haven't yet been able to figure out a way of saying this to that other 70 million who, who you know, have a view, culture, who needs it, you know, really? Um, this is all, this is all um, elite self-congratulation, you know, of you guys in the, in the corrupted, unchristian metropolis. And we, you know, we spend a lot of time to talking about how wonderful we are and what we do, the wonderfulness of what we do. We haven't yet figured out a way of actually taking that to people who do not only do not have that view, but think of that view as, as hostile. Simon, I think, I, 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 I think, I, yeah, sorry, I'm sure I'm, I'm elongating this. Okay. I think you I just want to say though, I think that's absolutely right. All of us, certainly of my generation, everyone, came into quote unquote, the high arts to make it the popular arts. Yeah. And if you want to make it the popular arts, you have to make it the, the popular arts for everyone. And we have yeah. to listen to those who see us as operating in our self congratulatory bubble. And we have to understand it and we have to reach and we have to listen with profoundness. And I profoundly believe that one-on-one -on -one conversation listening to your friend, finding the thing that is common between you and the person who voted in the absolute way that you would not, but kind of going, we are brothers and sisters. And we know that what we do in the arts is about increasing all of our humanities. Come with me, tell me how to do it better. Tell me how to meet you where you are. I think that's our challenge. And next year, let's, uh, let's put a KPI and see how well we've all done in it. For sure, for sure. Okay, thank you so much, all of you. It's been an absolutely brilliant discussion. And I hope all of you out there have enjoyed it as much as I, I certainly have, and I think all of us here. Okay, thanks. Bye-bye. <laughs>